Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. I'll start with a little teaser. I'm pretty sure you know this movie. Try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. There is no spoon? Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. The Oracle will see you now. Okay, so um, before going any further, uh, who has not seen the movie Matrix? Yes, really? <laughs> There's always one person? <laughs> okay, so for those of you who have not seen the movie, I'm going to spoil it, and I'm not going to feel guilty about it because it's about 20, year 20 years old, but you should see it because it's really good. Um, so... The ma what's the Matrix? The Matrix is basically this huge um, computer software where we're all living in, and we have no idea we're inside a software, but uh, it actually recreates the world around us. And what we see, what we feel, what we touch actually does not exist, uh, but we think it exists because a software is giving us the input that, like, a spoon is here or any objects around us. And it works pretty much the same for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Pretty much what we do is that we give inputs to a model, and the model processes the input and then gives an output. If you give the input that the information that the spoon is here, then the model will give the output that the spoon is there. But is it actually reliable? Today, I'm going to show you that we can hack neural networks into seeing things that are actually not there and I'm going to show you how to prevent against attacks. So my name is Tiffany Souter. I work at Gems Data Factory as a data scientist slash data engineer. I'm also a member of the GDG organizer uh, group in Paris, the Google Developer Group, and I'm a woman tech maker lead. So first, so what do you see here? Yes, it's a picture of a panda, and you'd be right to say that. And the model Google Lynette classifies this image as being a panda with a confidence of 57.7%. And now what do you see? It looks like the same image, right? And you'd be right to say this is still a panda. But this image is classified by the exact same model, Google Lynette, but it's being classified as being a gibbon with a confidence of 99.3%. So what's the difference between those two images? What's going on? The first image has been added with noise to it. A noise that has been um, very carefully crafted in a certain way that it perturbs the model into thinking that the panda is now a gibbon. And it's been multiplied by a very, very low number, so we humans cannot see the difference. But it's enough for the model to be, to, for the model to be confused. So this was published in uh, 2016 by um, the team working for Google Brain, uh, led by Ian Goodfellow, which I recommend you follow on Twitter because it's like his work is awesome. All right, so other researchers have been working on this issue, and uh, they've been multiplying those examples for uh, numbers of uh, multiple images. So here you can see pictures of um, a bus, a bird, a temple, uh, speakers, mantis, and a dog. And so all of the columns on the left are the original ones, and all of the pictures on the right are the ones that have been corrupted. And they've all been added with the noise that you see in the middle. So you see it because it's been uh, amplified 10 times, but again, it's actually much, much more subtle in the first image. So we can't see it in the corrupted image. And all of those images 
have been classified by AlexNet as being ostriches, all of them. So what this says is that basically you can craft your noise specifically to an image to point it to any label you want. Now the question is, can this apply to the real world? We can see that we can corrupt images, but does it still work if you print the image? So here you have the example of two images. The first image is an image of a library, and it's correctly classified as being a library. And it's the same image with added noise to it, and it's now classified as being a prison. A second example with a washing machine. Here the noise is much more obvious. So you can see that here the washer is correctly classified as being a washer. And then the washer with uh, noise and it's now being classified as being a doormat. And you can still confuse the model with much more subtle examples, like this ones. So here's still a washing machine. It looks pretty much the same. And then, so the model classifies it correctly as being a washer. And then with the more subtle noise, you see that the washer is now a switch or an oil filter is not really sure anymore. And at the end, it classifies it as being a switch. So scientists went a little bit further. And they were thinking, OK, you can fool a neural network into seeing other things. Um, can you hack security systems, like, let's say, face recognition apps? So you, you see on the top uh, left of the image, an image, a uh, uh, picture of the actress Reese Witherspoon. And in the middle, the scientist added noise around her eyes in the shape of frames. And this noise has been crafted in a certain way. And she's now being recognized uh, by a model as being Russell Crowe. So can we 3D print those glasses and try to wear them and see if this applied to the real world? So this is exactly what they did. They 3D printed those glasses. And you see here the examples of people performing two kinds of attacks. You have dodging attack and impersonation attacks. A dodging attack like this one means that the person on the, the two people here are not recognized by any face recognition apps anymore. So it's nice if you want to be like, uh, you know, if you're spying or something, or if you don't want to be recognized, like this, this can be really cool. And then you have those three examples where the people on the row, the top row, are impersonating the people on the lower row, which means that this guy is now being recognized as being Mila Jovic. So if this dude can be Mila Jovic with those glasses, you can be pretty much anything you want. And this is kind of creepy, though, because you see where this is going. Last example I really like um, is they 3D. So this, this team at Google, they um, 3D printed turtles. There was two turtle, a turtle that was a normal turtle. And there was another one, like this one, that had a little bit of perturbation on the shell. And this one is classified as being a rifle. Oh, this is not what I meant to do. There you go. OK, so that's the normal turtle. And it's Google Inception v3 classifier, correctly classified as being a turtle. No matter the angle, it's OK. And now that's the corrupted turtle. It's clearly a rifle to the model, which basically means that this turtle is now a deadly weapon to the eye of the classifier. But you can do the reverse also. You could, you could have a rifle that could look like a turtle. 
So, yeah. All right, so I could, I could still go on with a lot of other examples and tell you, you people can attack your neural networks and you should be aware of it. But I'd like to give you insights for why this works, because then you'd be able to protect against it. So to explain how neural networks work, um, I will try to break it down for you in very simple steps uh, that you can then iterate for more complex ideas. So now I'm showing you an example of this uh, image. It's an, it's an image from the MNIST database. It's a pretty um, famous database because it's like the 101 starting data set that you start off with when you want to learn about uh, neural networks. Those images are nicely shrinked to a 28 by 28 pixel image. And it's all black and white, so you don't have complexity of depth in the image. And all of the values of the pixels in the image um, corresponds to the color. So a black pixel would have a value of zero, and a white pixel would have a value of one. Anything in between is in the grayscale. What happens in a neural network is first you have an input layer. Basically, the input layer makes up for all of the pixels in your image. So if you have 28 by 28 pixels, you have 784 neurons. And all of the values in the neurons are the values of the pixels. At the very end of your neural network, you have what we call an output layer. And this is composed of all the neurons uh, that will give you the value of the probability of the classification of your neural network. So basically what it means is that if you have a database of um, numbers, you only have 10 different outputs from 0 to 9. And the value in all of those neurons will be the probability of the classification. So if your model works really well and recognize that this image is being a 9, then all of the probabilities would be closer to 0 for the numbers from 0 to 8 and closer to 1 for the classification of the 9. And all of those probabilities need to add up to 1. How do we get there? We have what we call hidden layers. And this is where all the magic is happening. This is actually not magic at all. This is just linear algebra. But I'll show you how to calculate the value of the first neuron and the first hidden layer. And this is what you can iterate through the process of your neural network. So let's do this. What's the value of the first neuron and the first hidden layer? It's basically just the sum of all of the values of the pixels in the previous layer. And all those values have been multiplied by a weight parameter, which basically defines your model. What you add to it is a bias term, which sets a threshold underneath which your, sh your neuron should not fire. And because the sum can be very, very high or very, very low, um, you want it to be a value that stills in between 0 and 1. So you need to shrink this value in between 0 and 1. And you do this with a function that we call the sigma function. It's actually an activation function. But we have different types of activation function, and the sigmoid one is one of them. But you have, if you know about artificial intelligence, there is a ReLU, there's different kinds of activation function. So yeah, this is the operation you do, just basic linear algebra. And you repeat this for every single uh, neuron in your hidden layers. And pretty much what your model is doing is a huge matrix multiplication. You have the vector of the value of all of the pixels in your image that you multiply with your weight parameters. You add your bias term. And you have your activation function that squishes, er squishes everything between 0 and 1. And at the end, you have a probability. So you don't need to remember all those steps. Really, what I wanted to show you here is that a neural network is just a huge function. It's a huge function that takes an input of 784 uh, values and outputs a vector of 10 entries that will be the probability of your, all your labels. This is it. That's the only thing that a like, um, deep learning uh, model is doing. All right, um, so now I can go on and try to explain 
what actually the model is doing. Um, seeing a function in 784 dimensions is complicated. It's convoluted. So I'll only show you an example in two dimensions. But bear in mind that this would mean your image would be only two pixels. Uh, but this is enough for you to visualize how it works. So let's say you're training your model. And you only have one input layer and one output layer, no hidden layers in the middle. The curves here, let's say the blue curve, is your data set of cats, and you have a data set of dogs. And your model is being fed with those data sets, and it's trying to draw a decision boundary. The decision boundary will help the model make a decision between if it's a cat, if the image is a cat or the image is a dog. And so it needs to draw a decision boundary that would separate those two data sets the best way it can. If you can only draw a straight line, then the best separation you can have with two those two data sets is this line. But you see it's not perfect. It has a little bit of like cats in the red area, which is supposed to be the label for dogs. And here you have a little bit of uh, the data set that lands in the realm of cats, which should be uh, different. So what you do to make your model more precise is to add hidden layers. By adding hidden layers to your model, you add dimensions to your decision boundary. So if you need a separation to be not linear, you add complexity, so you add hidden layers. The more hidden layers, the more deep your neural network will be. So this is why we call it deep learning. Um, here's something interesting, is that those two images represent the exact same thing. It's just not the same projection. Here your decision boundary is a curve. Here the decision boundary is a straight line. And all of the space around it has been bent in a certain way. This is exactly what the kind of computation your model will do while training. It's just bending the space around the decision boundary. So the decision boundary is linear, but your data set around it is shrinked. If you have more complex data set to separate, let's say it's more complicated to find, to make the difference between a cat and a tiger, then your data set will be a little bit more convoluted. How do you make two spirals in a certain way that you can draw a decision boundary that would be a straight line? You have to shrink the space apply transformation to it in a certain way that then your decision boundary can be a straight line that you can that you can draw between your two the data sets i'll let you see a, like with this uh animation because it's kind of mesmerizing and it's really cool basically what it shows is the transformation that you apply to your data set kind of separates the data set in the space you make it far, but it's actually close. <laughs> and like really what you need to do, like if I if I want you back your attention here, like you see here, like those squares um, are much bigger than the squares around here. But the space is the same. So if let's say you have an image of a cat landing around here and you want it to be a dog, the only thing you need to know is to push your points towards the decision boundary to make it misclassified. And this is just applying linear algebra to your image. This is what we're doing when we are hacking an image. We're just pushing a little bit every single pixels towards a decision boundary to make it misclassify. So now that we know how it works, we can make our own image. We can make our own hacked image. So for the challenge, I like make the comparison of different models, top five error rates. The top five error rate is basically a, um, yeah, it's a way to, to uh, evaluate how your model is performing. It's taking the, the, it's taking the top five labels that it's, do, it's giving to an, uh, to an image, and if the right answer is in there, then it's classified, like it says it's the right classification. And here you can see, so the higher, the, the lower, the better the model is. Here you see Inception D3 is right there. I put human performance right in the middle. 
So uh, we don't actually know how all humans would perform in data sets, but human uh, Andres Karpati wrote a blog that is really interesting, you should read it. But he basically went through the same process that a model would go through in order to assess his performance in classifying images. So like the poor guy went through thousands of images, hand, hand labeling them, it took him like weeks. But uh, we have now kind of an idea of how a human would perform on those data sets. And it's, it's nice to be able to see like that ResNet, Inception v3, Inception v4 is actually outperforming humans in labeling images. So why not hacking one that is better than us? Inception v3 sounds like a good example. So this is the architecture of Inception v3. This is just for your information. It's just to show you that before I showed you a neural network that was four hidden layers, this one is like huge. It, like all of the little squares that you see in between is a hidden layer and it has a lot of convolution here, max pool and things like that. Like it's really complicated. This is like real deep learning. Uh, the only thing you actually need to remember is that uh, the database, uh, sorry, the model has been trained on 1,000 classes, so it can recognize 1,000 different things. And it needs an image to be 299 by 299 by 3. 3 being the depth of it, so it's uh, one channel for color, so RGNB. All right. So I need a guinea pig for my experiment. I took a picture of my cat. And I was thinking maybe I can make it, m make her misclassified as being a, a spoon. And she apparently didn't like the joke. Uh, but so I took my image and resized it to a nice uh, 299 by 299 image. And the first thing you need to know is like if your model is actually classifying your image as being the right thing. So um, you do a little bit of uh, pre-processing on your image. It's very tiny, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you do a little bit of uh, pre-processing because you need all of your the values of your pixels to be in between zero and one. And then you ask Inception v3 what's the classification of your image, and uh, Inception v3 classified my cat as being a tabby with a confidence of 86.86 percent. And a tabby is just a stripped cat, so it's exactly what my cat is. <coughs> All right, so now I want my cat to be a spoon. How do you do that? So you take your model and you kind of reverse engineer the thing. You put your image as being the first hidden layer. Uh, the first layer is the input layer. And then you, you have the results for the output layer. So you have all the thousand classes and then you have the tabby, which is the highest one. And you have the classification of a spoon around here in this vector. And it was actually, at the beginning of my experiment, the classification of the spoon for my cat was really, really low. I put 0.00, .00 but uh, it's actually 0. Point, like times 10 to the minus 17 or something, which I thought was interesting because the model is pretty sure my cat is not a, a spoon. It's like very, very sure it's not. So I thought, it's really cool because it's a challenge. I need to transform this 0. 0.00017 17 times something by a, let's say, 99% confidence that my kite is a spoon. So how do you do this? OK, you need your gradient function. Basically, what the gradient function will do is that it will give you the direction, the direction towards the decision boundary. So let's say. I have the classification of the spoon r being really far from the image of my cat. How do I end up the image of my cat being run here in the space, landing around here in the classification of the spoon? I need to know where I have to put to push my image towards to, and I need to know like how far. So the gradient function gives me the direction, and so I tweak the value of every single pixels in my image a little bit towards this direction and space at each iteration. So basically what this while loop will do is that until the confidence of my cat being a spoon is not at least 98%, keep iterating through the loop. And 
I multiply this with the learning rate, and the learning rate is basically how big of a step should I need to take in this direction. You do, you do not want your steps to be too big because you can overshoot and land somewhere you don't want to. And you don't want your steps to be too small because it would take forever for you to get to the classification of a spoon. So you need to find the sweet spot where generating this image is not too long, but it's not infinite because you end up doing this and the classification of the spoon is around here. Okay, so by the way, for your information, it took me about like three hours to train, like to generate this image. So maybe this, there was a better way, but with the learning rate I put, it was about this time, just on my machine. And then you save your image. All right, so this is the results I got. The first image is the original one. The image in the middle is my cat being classified as a spoon by Inception V3 with a confidence of 98.65% uh, confidence. And I tried with other classification because I had a lot of fun with it. So I tried pineapple also. And it's even higher there. And like, it's not very clear here, but even on my computer, the difference is really subtle to the point where it's very frustrating because no matter how far you zoom in the picture, I was almost unable to see the difference. It was very frustrating. And at some point I was thinking, is it actually working? Like, uh, did I do something to the image? Like, what's going on? So I took a complete white image and I was thinking, I'll do this with a white image, I might see something. So I took the white image and I did the same process. I was like, so the white image should be now a pineapple. And this is the image I got. Look, so you, you probably can't see anything here. On my computer, I kind of see a little bit of uh, convolution somewhere. It's like really, really subtle. So I took the hacked image and I put it in GIMP and add a saturation to 100%. If you do this with a complete white image, you'll get a gray image. But this is the image I had. It's not gray at all. It's a lot of colors. What this means is that actually every single pixel on my white image has been changed. Um, but it doesn't look like a pineapple still. <laughs> and it's... Still, so you would think maybe it's drawing a pineapple somewhere, maybe I'll see, but no, like, uh, there's no pattern. Um, I don't, like, maybe you see it. You tell me. You, you send me a tweet or something, because I've been looking for a while. But I don't see pineapples, and I've been playing with it for a while. Like, I've been doing other classifications, just like, this is mayhem. And so, basically, what it means is that if you ask a deep neural network to draw you a pineapple, like it's unable to do it. It's very well trained to classify what the cat is, what a dog is. It's outperforming humans at doing those tasks, but it doesn't know actually what a dog is. It doesn't have the concept of a dog, the concept of a pineapple. And this is really disturbing. Anywho. Now that you know how to make your own hacking image, like you guys are now hackers, I know. Like what you are is like nice people and you want to protect against hackers. So uh, now that I'll tell you how to do your image, then now you want to protect against the bad people. So there is like, there's no magic trick. There's like, n really the research is still going on. What you, the only thing you can do is do generative adversary networks. So listen up if you have a uh, deep neural network and you want to protect. This is what you should do. We're going to play a little game. You have your model. It's nicely trained, and it knows how to make the difference between real images. And you duplicate it. So you have one instance of your model that is the, you call it the discriminator, and the second one will be the generator. And they're going to fight. So the first iteration is that you take your real image, like let's say the image of my cat, you give it to the discriminator and you ask the model, is it like, what is this image? And the discriminator will say, okay, I know this image, this cat, and that's a real image. 
and you reward your discriminator for, uh, for labeling it right. And now you ask your generator, which is the exact same model again. You ask the generator to generate a fake image, let's say my image of a pineapple. And you feed it to the discriminator. And the discriminator sees the image and thinks, oh, I know this, this is a pineapple. And it's not the right thing. You know it's not the image of pineapple because you generate it. And so you, you can like punish the discriminator for not being able to make the difference between a real image and a fake image. And you reward your generator for being able to fool the discriminator. And you do this iteratively for hours and days and like forever until your discriminator reaches a performance of 50%. What this means is that it's like the generator would be so good at generating fake images that the discriminator would have no idea if it's a real image or a fake one and you either won't be able to make the difference. And when you reach this performance of 50%, it means that it's only guessing. It's only guessing yes or no. At the end of your training, for example, on the MNIST database, generators are able to generate images kind of like those. And like it's it's in the middle of the training right here. You see that the now the generator is able to like almost draw nines, four ones. It looks like someone actually draw those images, but those are all artificially generated. Some of them are still meh, doesn't look like anything, but it's getting there. The take home message here is that no matter what you're doing with your neural network, always train it on fake images. Um, it's not very clear, I'll explain. So the blue line here that you see is standard training. Um, so your model has been presented with adversarial examples and here is the error rate. What this means is that here, your model that has been trained on standard image and presented fake images is always doing mistakes. It's always being fooled by fake images. While when you train with adversarial images, your model, the exact same model, is much more robust to making mistakes. So now it recognizes fake images and real ones. And what is really interesting here is on clean examples, if you train with fake images, you see that the performance of your model on real image, not fake ones, is even better. So what this means is two things. If you train on fake images, not only your model will be able to recognize fake images, but it will also be better at classifying real ones. So no matter what you do, always train on fake images. Like I'm not gonna say it enough. Just do it. <laughs> it's just much better for you. <laughs> so here is the a tweet that was uh, uh, at the beginning of this year from Yan Gufel, and he basically made the the historic um, you know uh, landmarks of the progression of generating fake images of GANs in the past five years. Those were the first faces that we could generate. This is where we were last year. This woman does not exist. This is a completely generated image artificially, and it's uncanny. She really looks real, and uh, it's only getting worse or better, no matter how you see it. So there's this really cool website call uh, this person does not exist dot com and all of those all of those people don't exist like none of them they're all generated by uh, on this website so you can try it it's really cool actually the, for the little story um, it the, it's from a researcher uh, Philippe Wang I think from Uber he took a model from the Nvidia um, company and uh, what he did is basically trained his model on a huge data set of, of images from humans. And, and, and what it does is that when you call on the website, oh, this one is freaky, um, but it generates fake images on the fly 
those are not from a database. Every time you refresh your page, there's a new person generated. It has never been generated before. It will never be in the future. This one is unique. Every time you refresh the image. And it's like at the second. Oh, the guy, oh, the dude here is funny. Because <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, it's really cool and it's really fast. And it's, it's really, yeah, this one looks real. There you go. Okay. So have fun with this. Like, uh, I actually had a lot of fun uh, hanging out on this website. And, uh, oh yeah, for the little story. So uh, this website was out probably at the beginning of this year in February. And it was a huge hit and everybody was talking about it. And there was like some kids on Reddit that asked Philippe Wong if he could do it with cats. So he didn't really have the time and uh, the data set was not as clean as the human one. So on thiscatdoesnotexist.com, you can find really cute cat, this cat does not exist. But because the data set was not as clean, you can also find really creepy cats, like this one. And you can try the website, is, <laughs> like, it's a lot of fun too. Um, hang out with, like I saw cats with like eight legs and it, they're all really funny. And because most of the data set for cats are memes, the, sometimes uh, this cat does not exist.com actually generate memes with cats, which is actually really funny. Um, as if uh, neural networks have humor. Um, all right, so there's also this website called uh, whichfacesreal.com. And it actually, it's, so it's like a game where you have to guess which face is real and which face is not. So uh, let's play now. Uh, who thinks the person on the right is the real one? Left? Okay, much more. So left. You're correct. Yeah, let's try again. Right? Left? I don't know, guys. Like, it was half-half. <laughs> I'll say left. Right? Yes, because you saw that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was the right one. Yeah, so the, the faces are like really well generated, but if you look a little bit closer to the background and uh, sometimes around it, like you see there's something fishy going on. Like this guy obviously does not exist. <laughs> All right. I like this example because actually the guy is real. <laughs> it was my first try and I was completely wrong. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Next. Um, yeah, so I'm reaching the end of my talk. And so, but I really wanted to show you this. I didn't really have the time to di deep dive into the article, but it was out like three weeks ago, you should definitely check it. Uh, but what we can do with GAN now is amazing. Like I can't emphasize this enough. GANs are awesome. And um, for a little record, like basically what, what those people do is great. Uh, they take a movie of someone talking and they take the landmarks around the face of the person talking. And so the neural network is able to take those landmarks and apply it to a picture that is not moving. And it looks like the picture is speaking. So I, I don't know if I have the time to show you everything, because it's five minutes, maybe. Ah, well. So you see, at first, uh, they take, so this is the same guy in the picture and in the, in real life. He is like talking, moving. And so the, the landmark detector actually takes all of the landmarks around his face while he's talking and they apply the landmarks to a training frames. So those are only, only images. Uh, by the way, like you, so you can make anyone speak and tell whatever you want which is creepy, so like, be careful with news in the future. Like, seriously? <laughs> and they did it at, at first with uh, several frames, 
but uh, they did it with less and less frames. And at the end, they're able to do it with only one picture. So if I take one picture of you, I can make you say anything I want. So basically, this is the, um, the, the architecture. I'm not going to go into the details of it, because I'm going to tell you wrong things, and I don't want to. Um, yeah, like I wanted to show you really cool. Where is it? Yes. Oh. So all those people are actually not talking. Um, and oh, yeah, yeah. Those are the cool examples. Marion Munner is going to speak. And it's freaky. Like, honestly, it's really cool, but it's also really scary. Like, um, there's a lot of applications to it, uh, really good and really bad. Really be careful. If you do work with GANs, please have ethics. Because, uh, like, come on. And um, like the last example, I really like. Oh, I'm gonna leave Einstein because I love him. It's like so cool. Like, I'm sorry, I'm so excited. Like, every time I see it, I'm like, what the heck? And the last one, because I love it so much, but Mona Lisa is speaking. It's great and scary. <laughs> okay, so GANs are not only here to make people talk, of course. Um, I'm going to go back here. Um, last thing. Uh, so, yeah, GANs are great. Like, you can see, it's not only to make those kind of things. GANs are actually really cool because they help us visit space, like, places in space that we cannot visit yet. For example, before GANs, like uh, neural networks, were used to do classification, things that humans can do already. If we have an image of a cat, we already know it's a cat. We don't need a deep, deep neural network to tell us it's a cat. It was very binary. It was an answering very silly questions like, what is in the picture? Now with GANs, we can explore other places in space. We can ask more complex questions like, what is a cat? Or like, draw me a cat, draw me a human, and it's now able to do it. What this means really is that if you have data sets of other things, let's say you have a data set of drugs, you're working in a pharmaceutical company, and you have drugs that are toxic, others that are not, some that can cure something, you can ask your model, draw me a molecule that can cure something without being toxic. This, those are things that we cannot do now because the space is so vast we have not visited yet. And researchers have troubles designing those drugs because we cannot test them all. But the deep neural network can lead us places in space we have not thought of it before. It works also in engineering. If you have like blueprints of cars that are like really fast, other cars that don't use as much fuel, you can ask your model to draw the, blu the blueprint of a car that would be ridiculously fast without using as much gas. And only your imagination is the limit. Like honestly, GANs is really exciting because it can answer questions that we have no answers yet. And um, I encourage you to be very, very curious about those things because like, it's going to open a whole new uh, world of vast possibilities of things. I don't know. You name it. Like, I, have, I don't have those ideas, but you might. So um, OK, um, I'm almost done. Uh, I'm actually done. <laughs> so yeah, GANs are cool. <laughs> Study it. And um, we're not flawless. We have our uh, adversarial examples, and those are optical illusions. So um, yeah, we're not like super powerful and everything. Thank you very much.